I'd like, like to welcome, welcome everyone to our July 20th Board of Commissioners meeting. Uh, I'd like to ask you if Commissioner Beaumont would lead us in a moment of silence and pledge of allegiance. For those that would prefer silence, okay. you're on the wrong guy. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you for this glorious day that you've created. What a wonderful county to live in, to grow up in to raise children and to work in. Father, I ask that you would bless this meeting and grant each of us commissioners wisdom in the decisions that are made this evening. Father, I thank you for the insight that you provided us and that you provide us. Lord, I ask you to bless this gathering and uh, help us to come to decisions that better this county. Father, we ask for your wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let me just uh, mention that uh, Chairman uh, White could not be here tonight. He had a, a personal matter um, develop, and um, he could not make it tonight. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, the next uh, item is the approval of agenda. Do we have any uh, amendments or adjustments to the agenda tonight? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if I could, I'd like to move to amend <coughs> these two items to the agenda as follows. Um, first one is continue of old business item PB19-20, Flora Farm rezoning to the September 21st, 2020 regular meeting. The second one is remove new business item A, consideration and possible action on the adoption of the strategic plan. All right. Thank you, Mr. McCord. Um, sorry. Do we have a second? All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm sorry. I thought you were going to ask for comments. On the agenda? Well, my question is. I'm sorry. I, uh, on item A, are we moving that to the September meeting as well? Um, I believe to the next meeting. Yes. Yeah, that's going to be to the next meeting. The other one's going to be to the 21st of September. Okay, my apologies. All right, the next item is going to be public comment. And I only have one individual signed up for public comment. Um, please keep in mind the public comment is limited to three minutes. Uh, when your time is getting ready to expire, you see a yellow warning light coming up there, followed by a red light. So please wrap it up at that point if you could. And the only person I have right now signed up is Josh Bass. If you could come up, state your name and address. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Josh Bass, I live at 103 Egret Cove in Moyot. Thank you to the Board of Commissioners for uh, having us here this evening. I am here not specifically to speak on something on the agenda. Uh, because in a few minutes, you will be hearing an application from the um, Historic Commission on the Pointer House. But as Chair of the Historic Commission, I just wanted to come and thank you as the Board of Commissioners for starting the Historic Commission and allowing us to move forward with trying to preserve historic properties in the county. We appreciate that. We certainly can appreciate your consideration on this uh, this evening. But we have been working for a number of years to try to save historic properties in the county, and we certainly hope to have other applications in the future um, that will go through this local landmark process in a way to save these properties. And we appreciate Commissioner Jarvis for uh, sitting in on our meetings as well to give us some input from the county commissioner. So just here to thank you for allowing us to do our work. We continue to hope to continue to do it and to get more and more properties um, under the status. So thank you for uh, helping us with it. Thank you. That's the only person I had um, signed up. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to speak a public comment? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close public comment. And next item is a commissioner's report. And I'll start to my right with Commissioner Beaumont. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, first, I'd like to uh, say that uh, I had the pleasure of attending our uh, July 3rd fireworks um, demonstration at uh, the Wellhead Club. And um, I wanted to uh, offer my uh, appreciation and thanks to county staff as to how that went off. Um, no pun intended relative to the fireworks. Uh, but it was 
um, it was almost like a private fireworks show. I, it, it, I, people respected the social distancing. I, I was just very impressed with the whole event. I don't think it could have gone off any better, although there were a couple of fireworks that didn't go off when they were supposed to, so they had to be done later. But other than that, it was just a great time. Um, I missed all the festivities, but under the conditions of the people that were able to attend, because I did have an opportunity to, to reach out and talk to some of our visitors, they appreciated actually being able to see fireworks this year because they weren't planning on it. Um, so that's the first item I had. And the second item, I just wanted to, um, you know, we've, we've heard uh, Commissioner McCord talk over and over and over about how many people are, are at our beach. And um, I just thought I'd, I'd read some of the statistics um, and this is for the month of May and June. So combine May and June, not the month of July. Um, these statistics come from uh, Kirtuck County's uh, Ocean Rescue. Um, as of the end of June, estimated almost 250,000 people have been to the beach. We have had 98 rescues of people that were in distress that required lifeguards to enter the water and bring them back to shore. We've had 172 minor injuries and eight major injuries, and those are typically coronary events. Um, with a whole bunch of tell folks get out of the water, public addressing, you know, they're busy nonstop. Um, I would not. In speaking with uh, Michael Cherry on Saturday, his comment was, we're experiencing a 4th of July weekend every weekend at the beach. We are the busiest we have ever been, and our lifeguards are the busiest they've ever been. So kudos to uh, Michael Cherry and his staff. Um, they've just done a bang-up job. Um, Corolla Rescue has been... Johnny on the spot with a multitude of, um, again, coronary events. And to date, we have not lost anybody in the ocean uh, to date. Um, and then finally, for those that did not see it, uh, Kirtuck County is one of four counties in the state of North Carolina that are, now have um, ultrasounds on ambulances. Um, so we have two ambulances that are running with a pilot program. So literally, if somebody has an injury and the EMS crew gets there, um, remember, it's all about letting the emergency room know what they're going to face when our patient gets there. This provides state-of-the-art interface with understanding what's going on internally to that individual. And again, we're, the, we're the, only the fourth county in the state of North Carolina to employ this system. And that went live this week, I believe. So making you know, leading the pack again. So that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Mullen. Uh, Commissioner Rutherford? <clears throat> I really don't have a comment tonight, believe it or not, but I do want to remind everybody with this extreme heat that we're going through, if you have elderly neighbors, please check on them and also make sure you take care of your pets. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rutherford. I'll go ahead and jump in real quick. And um, just want to state that, that I do sit on the Albemarle Regional Health Board and I do get daily updates um, specifically to um, our county, but with the surrounding counties as well as part of the um, Alabama Regional Health Group. And as of today, the uh, what we received uh, in Currituck County, there has been 51 confirmed cases. 20 of, all, 20 of those are still active. 31 have recovered, and we have no deaths in Currituck County. So uh, I just wanted to give that update. Um, we do get that uh, daily, and um, I do have discussions with Album River Health um, just to kind of get their gauge on things and, and what they're seeing out there. So, And that's all I have tonight. So Commissioner McCord. All right. Um, to touch on, it was hot today. Uh, try wearing a bulletproof vest uh, in 98-degree heat. It's pretty hot. Um, make sure people stay hydrated. Uh, protect your pets. Check on the elderly. Um, July 11th, I had the honor of attending a uh, Back the Blue rally. Uh, everybody, I don't watch the news, I quit watching it in April. Um, but the, um, if you watch the news, you see the defund the police and all this stuff. Um, I had the privilege of assisting um, our House of Representative Bobby Hannig, had his motorcycle in there, attended. We had about 180 plus bikes. 
and about 60 to 70 vehicles, trucks, and some antique trucks and some Jeeps and everything. It was really, really neat to see um, that many people. It started here. It rode through Currituck. It rode through Camden, picked up some more bikes, some more vehicles, went through Elizabeth City. They stopped there. They presented some stuff to the different sheriffs and police departments uh, involved. Um, then it went through Hertford County and then through Chowan is where it ended. Uh, it was an awesome event. Um, you know, like I said, if you dial 911, the police are going to be the ones that are going to come help you. So I, you see in the meet or hear on the media the defund the police and all that stuff. Um, touching on what he said, the ocean rescue Sunday, I work beach duty. I witnessed two ocean rescues back to back in less than 10 minutes. Um, that they rescued two people that were in distress, young child and then a, a family member, literally like within 100 yards back to back. Um, the month of July, between our fire department and the sheriff's department and Ocean Rescue, we have four boat rescues in, in the Sound in Curry Tech County. I was involved in one of them. Um, the one I was involved in, boat was sinking. I want to recognize two citizens of our county that just shows that we do have really good people that live here. Uh, Del Hassenbacker lives on Brumsey Road. Um, I don't even think I asked him. We saw the boat sinking. I, we got the call. We ran out there. Um, his boat was bigger than mine. Mine was actually at the house next door. And I said, can we take your boat? And he was like, what? I said, get in your boat. We took his boat, five people, three, three adults, two kids, residents of the county. And um, the next citizen I want to recognize, Chris Keene. Um, he's a detective in Kill Double Hills. He wasn't even on duty. He was trying to go fishing that day with his brother-in-law who's a volunteer fireman and they got so many law enforcement we had like four calls back to back they didn't go and he had already put his boat in the water we rescued that boat from sinking in the sound being a hazard 30 gallons of fuel uh, we brought that into the dock gave the people a ride got their vehicle assisted get it so we saved them and saved the the boat as well so those two citizens you know awesome i mean like i said we have great people that live here um and a couple other rescues involving the fire department. They actually have a meeting tonight between the sheriff's department and the fire department. Um, I was talking to uh, Keith Storff. They're having a meeting tonight where we're going to kind of get on more on board with some of the rescues. I mean, not that we did anything wrong because same thing. Everybody's been rescued. But they, um, you know, just some different protocols that we're going to combine between their policies and our policies. So I just wanted to touch on that, that, like, just in those events alone, just in the county, I mean, four boat rescues in July, and it's July 20th. Um, like you said, the saves on the beach. I witnessed two of them back to back. I mean, I didn't, I was there trying to calm down family members, but the ocean rescue, I mean, they were Johnny on the spot in the water. Um, I had just talked to uh, Mr. Brumsey in the back like 15 minutes before and one of them. Um, so like I said, I mean, you know, this whole defunding the police thing, it's just, it, I don't know. I'm not even going to make a comment because you know, we're on TV. But like I said, we do a lot the, the, it, in the citizens in, in this county, and we're very fortunate that the respect for first responders is given back. And I just want to appreciate the uh, community and the, the, the guests that, that visit Kerala as well as the mainland. So, But kudos to the first responders as well as the Ocean Rescue because they're first responders as well. So they do a phenomenal job. All right, that's it for me. Thank you, Commissioner McCord. Uh, Commissioner Etheridge? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I'd like to give kudos out to Tim and Taylor Posh and their staff at the Eagle Creek Restaurant for the fireworks show that they put on July the 11th. Um, very well attended, and everybody had a good time. And um, that's the type of community spirit we need to build throughout this county. And also, <clears throat> without objection from the other commissioners, I would like to see the county manager uh, send a letter to North Carolina DOT about installing a stoplight at Baxter Road and Caratoke Highway. It'll be a process that will take some time to try to do, but with the advent of the Shingle Landing Park, people coming out there and with the homes being built up there, there was two accidents there last week, uh, right at that uh, intersection. And as the entrance into Curry Tuck Station, that is, that's been located as a possible place for a stoplight. And I think we need to start working on it because we know what kind of shape DOT's in and we need to get in the queue to try to get that safety 
uh, issue put to bed and uh, provide a safer intersection at that site. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I again thank all our first responders uh, from top to bottom, and uh, they do a phenomenal job. And uh, I'm just always amazed by the dedication and loyalty that they show to not only the citizens of Curry Tuck County, but to our guests that come through here. Uh, it's a tough job, and I'm glad there's people that do that job for us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Etheridge and uh, Commissioner Jones. <coughs> uh, thank you. Um, I'd like uh, Commissioner McCord mentioned, I do want to give a shout out to the Currituck County Sheriff's Department, um, the fire departments, and the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission for saving over 20 lives uh, from boating accidents this, this month. And um, with their efforts, their tireless efforts, uh, our citizens and our visitors are much safer. So I thank all of those people involved in those rescues and Ocean Rescue has been phenomenal this year. The article was fantastic about their efforts. Um, the Trillium Northern Region Advisory Board met Tuesday. And I am proud to announce that Shawboro Elementary has been awarded $5,000 for the high completion rates of Trillian's online mental and physical wellness classes called Safe Schools, Healthy Kids. And this completion rate was by both staff and students. This presentation of $5,000 will be made for formally sometime this fall if schools ever get back to Virtually. quote normal or <laughs> sometime in the future. Uh, so way to go to the staff and students at Shawboro. I'm very, very proud of you. Uh, and then finally, um, practice patience as you are driving through this county. <laughs> it, you're not going fast any, it, especially if accidents occur. I, I was telling several members of the board I was uh, one of those people stuck in traffic Saturday with the uh, accident on the bridge. And I just would like to caution people, if you have a place you need to get to quickly, plan ahead. Uh, don't make your impatience someone, someone's accident. Uh, that is no way to start a vacation, and it certainly is no way to, uh, to live in the county and try to get anywhere quickly. So practice patience. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank Mr. You, Chairman, could, Jarvis. could I just add yes, something to what she's... Yes, also keep in mind that farm equipment move up and down our highways. And uh, I can't tell you how many one-finger waves I get when I'm on a tractor out on the road. So understand that we have to move up and down the highways to get to different farms, and uh, that patience is much appreciated. So I'd like to add, too, the last one we did was the first time we haven't had an incident afterwards, so I appreciate that. So. Well, thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is the county manager's report. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to keep my comments fairly brief this evening. First of all, uh, we have um, some construction projects that are ongoing. Just thought I'd give a quick uh, update on those. Um, all of them are moving along quite well. Um, the ABC store in Kerala, um, we've had some material issues, so we're gonna, there might be a slight delay on that project. We've had um, some rain delays on the public safety building, but still has started going up there. So we will be having a... Uh, it's called a topping out ceremony once the steel is all erected. Um, and then we look forward to having a groundbreaking, even though construction has already started um, at Shingle Landing Park. We put that on hold because of uh, COVID-19. So to get both of those scheduled and, uh, and move forward. The one to touch base real quick, um, I've heard some of the same questions about uh, COVID-19 testing and reporting and, and what all of that looks like. Um, a lot of people kind of wonder why don't we do the same thing that Dare County does. Um, folks that live in Currituck need to understand that we are part of a regional health department, which is what um, Commissioner Payment was alluding to, have them all regional health services. Um, so they actually handle all the testing and reporting and reporting to the state. So uh, we rely on them to get certain pieces of information. Um, having said that, they are going to be holding a testing um, clinic in Kerala for residents of Kerala. There was a a request for that and uh, the Almar Regional Health Services heard that so it'll be held at Kerala Chapel on the 28th of July from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. so and this is for residents um, you know obviously we've got a, a pretty large population of visitors up there right now but 
with that amount of time it is just for residents. So um, encourage folks to go out if, they, if they'd like to get tested who are in Corolla, feel free to do that. Um, other than that, I don't have anything else unless the board has questions this evening. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, next on the agenda is going to be our public hearings. And the first item we have is HPC 20-1 MC Pointer House. Anthony Gresky is requesting to designate his property as a historical landmark. The house is located on 1.44 acres and is located at 219 Shingle Landing Road, Moyoc. Parcel identification number 014B-000-0026-000, the Moyoc Township. And with that, um, I guess we have our presenter already up here. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. So tonight you are hearing the county's first application for local historic landmark designation. And uh, this is a result of a lot of work by county staff as well as the members of the commission to get to this point. Uh, the commission was formed by the board in July of 2016. Uh, actually, some of our commission members are here, like Chairman Bass, who spoke earlier, and uh, Mrs. Barbara Snowden, as well as the applicant, uh, Mrs. Virginia Agresti. So, prior to receiving landmark applications, the Commission had two tasks to complete. The first was to conduct an inventory of historic properties in the county and to adopt that inventory with those eligible properties. And the second was to adopt design guidelines. These are standards that we apply to the properties to ensure that they retain their significance and integrity. And so the Commission did adopt that inventory. The property uh, you're reviewing tonight is one of those inventory properties. And the design guidelines that were adopted are the Secretary of Interior standards for uh, rehabilitation and preservation. They're very they're basic standards, but they they're a starting point to make sure that properties continue to to keep their significance and integrity. <laughs> this process is absolutely voluntary. Um, it's an honor, as the community believes the property deserves recognition, recognition and protection. And it also provides uh, for an annual tax deferral of 50% provided the property's important historic features are maintained. <clears throat> so in order to designate a property as a local historic landmark, a property must be found by the commission or the board to possess, or and the board, to possess special significance in terms of its history, prehistory, architecture, archeology, span or cultural importance, and to retain the integrity of its design, setting, workmanship, materials, feeling, or association. Now getting to the property and landmark request before you tonight, Anthony Agresti and Virginia Agresti are the current owners of 219 Shingle Landing Road and they are present tonight. And they have applied for this local historic landmark designation. The property is called the MC Pointer House and it's identified as inventory property number CK0237. The property is located at 219 Shingle Landing Road, adjacent to Shingle Landing Creek, and it's at the intersection of Camellia Drive and Shingle Landing Road. And this, here's an aerial here, um, that kind of shows you the surrounding area as well as Kiritok Highway out here. The MC Pointer House is proposed for designation for its historical significance. Historically, the Pointer family has been in Three Tech County since the beginning of the 1700s. MC Pointer was a seventh generation Pointer in the county. He was a prominent and highly respected citizen of Moyoc, and he was a successful farm, farmer and store owner. His store included a post office, and he was postmaster in Moyoc, according to the post office department records, in 1881, 1885, and 1889. And one of his general stores, which he built in 1902, still stands today several blocks from this home. That's where there's currently the Craytuck Homes offices. The entire 1.44 acre parcel is proposed for designation, and here's a view of that proposed boundary here in yellow. Uh, this is also in your agenda packet, uh, page 23. The parcel includes the home as well as a contributing barn that was built around the time the house was constructed in 1899. The house is also proposed for designation because of, it has architectural significance. 
again constructed in 1899 by Mr. M.C. Pointer for his family. It's a Queen Anne style home with East Lake influence. Uh, Charles East Lake was an English furniture designer and, and when you, when you see like gingerbread style houses, some of those have his, um, his design elements on them. And I'll, I'll have some pictures here in a second to show you. The house does remain in its original location. The exterior architectural details show a high level of craftsmanship and design, and most of those original materials are still present. So here's a view of the front facade facing Shingle Landing Road. It's a two-story T-shaped home with a slightly projecting two-story front gable bay, uh, gable roof bay block with cutaway windows. <clears throat> Un underneath these gable ends here are these brackets uh, of an unusual style. You can see they're, they're turned almost like furniture and that's that East Lake style. Uh, further with the East Lake influence and uh, Queen Anne style, or the spindle frieze here of the hip wrap around porch, and these detailed, uh, unusually detailed milled and pierced brackets. And there's a closer up look of the spindle frieze and the detailed brackets, as well as the turned porch posts. Uh, most of the windows on the house incorporate this molded drip hood, uh, these scrolled console like brackets and this sawtooth ornamentation. Here's the northwest elevation of the house that faces the creek. It's the widest, flattest elevation. It features the same gable end style. Um, wait, sorry. Yeah. It features the same gable end style as the front facade. And here's a, a zoomed in view of those, those gable ends. Um, it features a molded cornice here, molded returns, a starburst patterned stickwork, and paired single light windows with molded drip edge, sawtooth ornamentation, and scrolled brackets. It's a lot of detail here. The southeast elevation features a gabled end, um, just like the one I showed you, and the rest of that hipped wraparound porch. The rear elevation features the rear T gable and the gable end. You can see it does not repeat that pattern stick work here. It's horizontal signing. Uh, it does not feature the molded cornice, but it does feature the molded returns and the same centered paired single light hinge windows. And above this covered rear entrance is the remaining balustrade of the original second floor porch. You can see here there was an addition to the property. And here's a zoomed in view of that detail of that rail and brackets on the rear of the home. The property includes a two-story, 10-roofed wooden barn that was built as a, at the same time as the house. And the barn sits to the rear of the main house and consists of three bays and a hayloft with a cutout door and the gable over the middle bay. All the other sides of the barn are sided with no additional openings. And here's another view of this, of kind of the setting of the property, uh, looking from the north side of Shingle Landing Creek. The local landmark designation report was submitted to the State Historic Preservation Office for review. And that office issued a letter on May 22nd, 2020, in which it noted that the MC Pointer House appears to be an intact and excellent example of the Queen Anne style of architecture with Eastlake decorative elements and the Pointer House retains many of its original architectural details, and it is one of the small class of the more high style interpretations of Queen Anne in Curry Tuck County, and the best preserved example in Moyoc. And staff recommends adoption of the designating ordinance. And on July 1st, 2020, the Historic Preservation Commission held a public hearing, and they also recommend that the board adopt the designating ordinance. And I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you may have at this time. Any questions from the board? All right. Okay. I do have one question. Say if they were to do any improvement to the outside of the house, could the designation be removed? That's or? a great question. So once a property is designated as a local historic landmark, 
It's for, for any exterior alterations, it will have to go through a pro process of obtaining a certificate of appropriateness, which is when the Historic Preservation Commission will review that application to make sure that it's, it's, it retains its uh, significance and integrity uh, of design. So um, if they did that without going through that process and getting it approved, then, it, then that, could be, that could be a problem. So say if y'all did not approve it, then you could take the tax credits away, correct? Through a process, yes. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? I, I do have one too. Far as like like Mr. Uh, Commissioner Etheridge said about the 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 change or whatever. Far like I noticed like they had done some nice landscaping to the property. I mean, it looks really really nice. I mean, is there any guidelines to something like that as well, as far as through the historic? So any any exterior change to the property should be reviewed by the commission or staff, and that's laid out in the commission's um, guidelines. So, um, and it's like the, the guidelines I mentioned earlier, they're Secretary of Interior standards, they're very broad. Um, we don't have any specific language about specific types of landscaping that's required or, or not permitted. We would just want to make sure that it that it um, continues to reflect that. The story, that I mean, like if, if they sold it and somebody purchased it and put an in-ground pool in palm tree, I mean, you know, I don't know if that would be something where they'd have to go through. They do. They, they do have to go through the process to get that approved. Okay. Because, like I said, it, it's very nice. I think it's something wonderful that the county's doing to help preserve the older homes in the county. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, how, how long did it take to go through this process? In case someone's uh, watching and thinks that their property may, be, uh, may qualify, how long could they expect this process to take? Uh, this process, this particular process, became a little bit longer because of the, the COVID um, interruption with meeting schedules. But typically, you would uh, apply for, you could apply and then your application will be reviewed by the State Historic Preservation Office, and then it goes to the Historic Preservation Commission and then to this board. So about three months. Okay. Any other commission questions or comments? If not, I'll invite the applicant to come up and speak if they would like to. Virginia Gresty. Um, we just uh, want to thank you for, for considering our house to be the first property in the historic uh, landmark program. Um, the reason we moved to the house is because of its architecture, and so we're really excited to maintain that. So we both have a passion for historic properties, and um, especially of the Victorian era, which is this is high style of Victorian. So we're very happy that uh, we have this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I am going to open up public hearing. I have no one signed up to speak on this. Is there any in the audience that would like to come up and speak? <laughs> okay, come on up. <laughs> <laughs> he agrees with her mom. <laughs> All right. Um, that being said, I'm going to close the public comment portion of this, and I'm going to open the floor to the board for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the ordinance designating the M.C. Pointer House as a local historic landmark in Currituck County because the applicant has demonstrated that the property has both architectural and historical significance and the property retains integrity of its design, setting, workmanship, and materials. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you. Next on the agenda is going to be PB 1914, Moyock Farms request for an amended preliminary plat use permit for 
a 31 lot traditional development located at 1216 Caratoke Highway, parcel identification number 0023-000-0007-0001. Moyak Township, and this is a quad uh, quasi judicial. So, if anyone wants to speak on this matter, please come forward to be sworn in. And could I ask you to place your raise your right hand, place your left hand on the Bible? Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so God? Thank you. Okay, who is going to be presenting this? Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, what before you, what is before you tonight is amended um, whoops. Is an amended use permit. Uh, this is this is the area. Um, it's also called the auto auction property, um, located just north of branch land. It is zoned general business currently. It is in the full service area of um, the 2006 land use plan and is in limited service in the uh, Mayock Small Area Plan. Um, so this came before you in uh, August of 2019. It's a 31 lot um, traditional subdivision. Um, and it, in August of 2019, what was approved basically had two entrances, one coming out to the false development and one coming on to crossing the railroad track and um, coming out onto Caratoke Highway. The amended request um, eliminates the crossing, the railroad crossing and the access onto Caratoke Highway, shows the potential of a, of a third pond if needed, um, and the only access is going to be out into the false development. So, once again, originally it was originally approved uh, in August of 2019, and now we're requesting to amend it. That is the only change that is um, that is being requested. So the development will now access through the false development, um, and the development does meet its connectivity uh, score with the loop around and the um, false con connection to the false. So the request includes 31 lots uh, with a minimum lot size of two acres. That's still the same county water and individual septic tanks systems. Um, uh, over 30 acres of open space will be reforested and the units will be um, 0.31 dwelling units per acre is the overall density. Review of the full service designation of land use plan and a limited designation in the Moyak Small Area Plan. So, um, this development is in the Shawboro School District. Um, we'll get to that. So, uh, with this very limited small change, uh, we're not a small change, but this, um, this since this is the only change. Uh, the use permit standards, we can review those, that this use will not endanger the public health or safety. And acquiring the access through the FOSS and eliminated Caretoke Highway access has, allevi has alleviated the TRC, the Technical Review Committee's concern about the safety uh, of accessing 31 lots over the uh, railroad crossing. Um, so the use will not injure the value of joining or abutting lands and will be harmony with the area. So because this is the applicants, the density is similar to that of the ranch and subdivision and the proposed residential subdivision will be surrounded by residential uses, will be in harmony with the area. And it is in conformity with the land use plan and other officially adopted plans. The Mayock Small Area Plan has this area's limited service, which is one to one and a half units per acre. The area, the 2006 land use plan has this as full service where you can have up to two to four acres, uh, I mean, sorry, two to four units per acre, and this, once again, is only at 0.31 units per acre. And the use will not exceed the county's ability to provide adequate public facilities, including but not limited to schools, fire and rescue, uh, law enforcement, and other county facilities. Um, this development was previously approved in August of 2019. Um, this development is in the Shawboro Elementary School District, and based on the January 2020 ADM, Shawboro Elementary School is at 87% capacity. 
currently and 90% capacity for the reduced class sizes um, that will become for K through three effective the 21-22 school year. So if you still have concerns about that, the Board of Commissioners may uh, impose additional conditions of approval, um, such as phasing, if you so desire, to coincide with our concern over adequate public facilities. But once again, this is already um, received a conditional use, I mean a use permit for 31 lots in August. They are now coming in and requesting the change, of uh, losing the entrance off the highway uh, and the railroad crossing and having the only access through the FOSS development. Uh, the TRC does recommend approval of this request. Um, it is, it complies with all the applicable review standards of the UDO and the proposed meet Proposed use will meet the use permit review standards of the UDO. Uh, the conditions necessary to to ensure compliance with the review standards of the UDO. Um, once again, these were part of the original approval uh, to install perimeter ditches in a way that serves both the new subdivision and improves conditions on ranch land, and deepen and lay back uh, slopes, lay back the ditches, and put existing ditch on proper grade where permission can be obtained from the adjoining property owners. If permission is not forthcoming, install a parallel ditch approved by stormwater staff. Once again, those were part of the original approval of, that, of this use permit. Um, there were three other uh, conditions that were part of concerns over the um, access of the high highway and the railroad crossing. So, um, and in your agenda packet, you have uh, the plans and the circulation pattern that will um, once false is developed and the access through there, you can see <coughs> that, um, this subdivision will be accessed and once again, not off of the highway. And I'll be glad to answer any questions the board may have. The only change is the access to the property. Everything else remains the same. Back to that map so we can <coughs> the previous request had an access this this street going straight across the railroad and accessing the highway um, and this was a cul-de-sac so they looped it here around and take it back out so the road design is the only change the density is still the same um, average lot size is still the same, so the, the road design and access points are, are the differences. This is in the Shawborough School District where we do have capacity. Any other questions from the board? If not, I'll ask the applicant to come up, please. Please state your name. Uh, Mark Thistle, Thistle Professional Group, and we're representing the applicant. Um, as Ms. LaCicero stated, the, the main purpose of this request is to reconfigure the project to eliminate the railroad crossing, which, as you probably remember, was the main concern that this board expressed with the original approval. So we've found a way to, to eliminate that concern. I would like to ask for one small correction to the staff report, and that is the condition on laying back the dishes. It calls for a six to one slope. So we discussed that at the original approval, and the board actually approved a three to one slope because if you have a three foot deep ditch, a six to one slope gives you a ditch that's 36 feet wide at the top, and there's really not space to accommodate that. And the original approval, the original use permit was a three to one slope, which is a standard uh, ditch slope. The um, Ms. LaCicero did a, a good job of explaining the use permit criteria and uh, how this meets all the criteria for the issuance of the use permit. The one thing that I would add in uh, Part A, as far as public health and safety, we've 
not only in the process of eliminating the railroad crossing, we also did a traffic analysis of the additional traffic that would be going through FOSS. A copy of that analysis is in your report that shows that um, there is minimal impact uh, to the FOSS track and the, the traffic that's already slated to connect to 168 at that location. And with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Any questions on the board? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, next, I'll open up a public hearing. I have two individuals signed up. The first one is Dennis and Lori Williamson. Sir, we didn't want to speak. I was just looking for the information. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next, I have Bonnie. Is it Kraus? Um, I guess you can see a staff member after the meeting and they can get that information from you then and is that that's all you needed was a copy of that okay. Okay. that's all I had signed up is there anyone else that would like to speak on this matter I didn't get a chance to sign up we got here late if not I am going to close public hearing and I'll ask the board for a motion Mr. Chairman, since this is in Mayotte District, <coughs> I move to approve PV 19-14 Mayotte Forms, amended preliminary plat use permit with staff recommendations because of the applicant has demonstrated the proposed use meets the use permit review standards of the UDO. And with that, <coughs> I would as Mr. Bissell asked, use the three to one slope instead of the six to one slope. Use permit review standards. The use will not endanger the public health or safety. Acquiring access through Faust and eliminating the Curry Tuck Highway access has alleviated the technical review committee's safety concerns regarding a new potentially unsignalized railroad crossing to Curry Tuck Highway. The use will not injure the value of adjoining or abutting lands and will be in harmony with the area in which it is located. The density is similar to that of ranch land subdivision and the proposed residential subdivision will be surrounded by residential uses. So it will be in harmony with the land to the west and the south has been developed into single family homes. The land to the north has been approved for, excuse me, a planned development and land to the east across Carito Highway is farmland and single family lots. This track will be developed into lots that are larger than the adjacent ranch land subdivision. In addition, over 30% of the land will be preserved as open space. Drainage improvements will be made that will benefit both the new subdivision and the existing subdivision. The use will not injure the value of adjoining lands or abutting lands and will be in harmony with the surrounding area and is believed to be a benefit to the value of the adjacent community. The use will be in conformity with the land use plan or other officially adopted plans. The small area, Mayotte small area plan classifies this area as limited service. The proposed development density of 0.31 units per acre is well below the one to 1.5 units per acre envisioned in the Moyot small area plan. The land use plan classifies this area as full service. The proposed density is only 0.31 units per acre, well below the densities of two to four units per acre envisioned in the land use plan. Some of the relevant policies include MSAP policies TR2, IS4, FLU1, CC1, and land use plan policies ES1, HN1, TR4, TR8, and PP. <coughs> use will not exceed the county's ability to provide adequate public facilities. The number of students generated by the amended plan is not different from what was originally approved. So, <coughs> excuse me. 
The BOC may propose additional conditions of approval, such as timing limits on residential building lots or units available for occupancy to ensure adequate public facilities remain sufficient to serve the development. The development is limited to fill in the blank residential building permits for a 12 month period, and I am not recommending that be part of the approval. The other public facilities are sufficient to serve the development. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second it. Mr. Chairman, yeah. just one point. Clarification for staff purposes. Um, Sir. So, uh, Commissioner Etheridge, the two um, conditions about installed perimeter dentures in a way that both serves the new subdivision and improves conditions for ranch land and deepen and lay back at a three to one slope but existing ditch on proper grade where permission can be obtained from the adjoining property owners. If permission is not forthcoming, install a parallel ditch as approved by stormwater staff. Are those the extra conditions you had in mind? Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any other comments from the board? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. The next item is PB19-24, New Bridge Creek Estates. Request for a preliminary plot use permit for a 37 lot conservation subdivision located off Caratoke Highway, parcel identification number 0031-000-064N-0000 Moyock Township. This is also quasi-judicial, so anyone wishing to speak on this, please come up and get sworn in. Mr. Vice Chairman, I'd like to make the board aware that a uh, immediate family member of mine has just inherited land that is adjacent to this property, but it will not have any bearing on my vote. Okay, well, thank you for disclosing that, Commissioner Etheridge. If I could ask you to raise your right hand and put your left hand on the Bible. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Okay. Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the board, before you tonight is an application. For you tonight is for preliminary plat use permit for a 37 lot residential subdivision. The applicants, Newbridge Creek LLC, has submitted this application and it involves, as you can see on here, several lots, which includes the redevelopment of some exempt parcels. Uh, the property is located at the southern end of Moyock Township. It is in Moyock Township. It is immediately north of Beechwood Shores development. And um, the redevelopment includes five <coughs> exempt parcels. Exempt parcels are lots that are greater than 10 acres in size. It was part of a prior development called Fairby Acres. Some of those lots do exist and access, have an alternate means of access to the property. And then this residual parcel, which is access by a, uh, an opening here that's part of the, the um, existing residual tract. Next slide, please. Uh, proposed development is zoned agricultural. Uh, the Rolling Creek is located just to the north of this property. Along the eastern boundary, there is a creek that divides Beechwood Shore subdivision and this development. Located to the uh, South is zoned agricultural and GB. Current land uses include residential, woodland, and farmland. And to the west is a low density residential zoned agricultural. Next slide. The application request is a type two conservation subdivision. And as I mentioned, this includes 37 lots. 
A conservation subdivision requires that the development establish a theme. This theme for the proposed development is wetland preservation, uh, where wetlands will be the primary conservation area, and the wetlands will include wet, the primary conservation area will include not only wetlands, but the riparian buffer as well. Uh, where you see the 37 lots, this is the uplands. Pretty much everything back here uh, would be identified as wetlands. Uh, the area that contains the wetlands and the primary conservation area is 64.46 acres. And overall, the development encompasses 104.09 acres. <coughs> Uh, part of that wetland area includes some Cam or coastal wetlands, and that's 4.42 acres, where, which is not included in your density calculations. With this type of conservation subdivision, the applicant selected um, a, a uh, density allocation of 0.4 units per acre, and as part of that, you, in order to acquire that, you have to dedicate at least 60% open space in your development. The, this particular application includes 61%, uh, and the minimum lot size that's required for conservation subdivision is 30,000 square feet. This proposed application will, will have 40,000 square foot minimum lots. Uh, there is a 47.54 acres of jurisdictional wetlands that's part of this um, open space area, and that jurisdictional wetland boundary, it's a preliminary jurisdictional boundary, is found in, on packet page 158, if you'd like to review that, submitted by the, uh, and prepared by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned there, this is really part of um, redevelopment of a an exempt subdivision as well as some residual parcels. There's also uh, part of this parent parcel are some existing minor subdivision lots. There are two minor subdivision lots that are zoned general business and because this is a conservation subdivision, general business lots cannot be included in, as part of that conservation subdivision. So they elected to divide those properties out so it's not a part, it's been recorded. Um, it had a uh, easement access, a cross access easement that would provide access to these two lots. Uh, the applicant felt that it would be better served by providing a secondary access to this property uh, that would be located here in between the two general business lots. So they are also um, submitting an amendment to that minor subdivision plat that would uh, that would dedicate a right-of-way, it would be a private right-of-way, um, that would adjoin the proposed street system in this development. That's a separate application that is being reviewed by staff. It's an administrative review. Um, NCDOT has, in fact, issued a driveway permit for this location. Uh, it included the the access, which is about a thousand feet from Beechwood Shores Drive, which is consistent with our driveway spacing or our roadway spacing requirements in the ordinance. There is a concern that staff has with the, um, the access separation between what is their primary access point and this secondary access point. It's only about 600 feet. Uh, the applicant is currently working with DOT to make sure that the adequate language is provided to the county that um, will support that access and be consistent with the ordinance and provide a level of uh, safety and uh, access control that would be achieved uh, by our ordinance. This access, and again, this is not part of this subdivision, but I do want to make you aware of what would be proposed and um, the alternate access, but this this access here will will also include a uh, diesel lane off of Caratoke Highway for northbound traffic, which probably would provide less of a concern between these two intersections because any southbound traffic would be turning in most likely there um, and accessing here. Uh, 
So I do want to let you know that that is currently under review and being evaluated by the state. Uh, doesn't have anything to do specifically with this development because they are providing their main access point here, but there could be a secondary access here. Just the, um, Don, if I, if I may, the secondary access, is that over there by, um, like, the, the Fairview Farm, so about closer to Beachwood Shores? So, yes, it is closer to Beachwood Shores. There is an existing house and large uh, metal building right, that's the new one. almost complete that's located here to give you some representation of, as to where that is. Beachwood Shores Drive would be at the top part of this map. Um, but uh, it's in between that's a, these that's two That's the entrance that they have there. now to go to those five, ten-acre lots? That is, they, they do use this access here to go to, um, to access the remaining ten-acre tracks. Okay. Yes. It extends, um, the easement actually extends through this property. It will be improved to the property line uh, with utilities roads and sidewalks it will go um, pavement up to the property line there um, talking about the streets the 37 lot subdivision will uh, actually generate 370 trips per day because uh, typically a single family dwelling will generate 10 trips per day the proposed streets are designed uh, within a 50 foot wide right of way and will include 20 foot of pavement a roadside swale and a sidewalk. The five foot wide sidewalk will be within the street right of way between the pavement and the roadside swale. Oftentimes you'll see these sidewalks that are extending into um, people's property and uh, covered under a pedestrian easement. With this particular application, uh, it will be inside the right of way. And as I mentioned, all utilities will extend to the property line. Um, being this, this property line where we'll have interconnectivity. Uh, lots will be served by county water and on-site septic systems. The elevations of this property are a concern that we have, and um, the existing elevations of this property ex range from about one foot above mean sea level to five feet above mean sea level. That's in part because it is so close to the creek. But part of this area, you do typically see some tidal influence flooding as well as storm event flooding. Um, there are two ponds, stormwater ponds, that are being proposed for this development, uh, one in this area and one in <coughs> this area, uh, that all of the stormwater will be directed and channeled to those stormwater um, ponds. We do know uh, from the applicant's application that they will in fact fill um, this property to bring it up to the required elevation for finished floor. That gets it above the 100-year the, um, storm elevation and they will be doing that. But I did want to make the board aware of the lower elevations. Ms. Uh, yes. I, that being said, the, the, I guess they all perked just fine though? Being that they did. They did. There was one that um, I think initially did not, it, that received an unsuitable evaluation and they later came back, reevaluated it, and it's provisionally suitable. Uh, the soil survey indicates that the residential lots are predominantly in the Roanoke fine sandy loam soils, and those types of soils typically flood. Uh, at least for brief periods, and are usually poorly suited for urban and recreational uses because of, the, because of their flooding, wetness, slow permeability, and the low strength. And the low strength is when you uh, construct homes and other types of buildings on these properties. You, you, sometimes you have to amend the, the soils uh, and have uh, soil analysis done, and you might have to put gravel or some other type of material in there to help with that strength. The wooded area, which is located to the rear of this property, is also identified as a significant heritage area. It's the Lower Toll Creek Woods and Marsh area. 
There's no development slated for that, so it is consistent with that significant heritage area. The recreational and park area dedication will consist of 1.02 acres. What was proposed was being um, at the end of the street and a portion of it was part of the stormwater pond wetlands. Um, the, after review and evaluation of that, it was determined that it would not provide for an adequate access and payment in lieu would better serve uh, this request so uh, staff will be asking for a payment in lieu of dedication for recreational park area. There is water access that will be proposed uh, for the community. It will involve a five foot wide boardwalk that will extend to the water's edge, not along the water's edge, but up to the water's edge. There was a community meeting that was held for this project in September, September 20th, 2019. The nearby property owners did ask questions regarding lot size, schools, water access, and stormwater. The complete report is in your packet. It's on packet page 138. Excellent. The board shall decide on a finding that the application or the applicant demonstrates the proposed use will meet all the use permit criteria and the review standards. The applicant is responsible for presenting evidence on the first two standards. Staff will present evidence related to the county adopted plans and the adequate public facilities. Next slide. The 2006 land use plan classifies the site as rural and conservation, and it's also located within the Moyoc sub area. The 2014 Moyak Small Area Plan also identifies this property as rural and conservation on the future land use map. And that de definition between rural and conservation, that common factor is, is about where the tree line is, and that's about where the wetlands begin. Next slide. So the 2006 land use plan, as I mentioned, indicates this area as rural and conservation. It does contemplate densities of one unit per three acres. The uh, policy emphasis for the Mayock sub area actually indicates densities should be limited to one to three units per acre where on-site wastewater is proposed and other county services may in fact be limited. The proposed use is in keeping with policies identified as, and I'll summarize a complete list of that and a complete um, detail of that policy is in your packet. ES2 deals with non-coastal wetlands so that they are conserved for their important role. They play in absorbing floodwaters, filtering stormwater runoff, recharging the groundwater table, and providing critical habitat. ES3 is coastal wetlands shall be conserved for their valuable function they provide in protecting water quality and providing critical habitat for the propagation and survival of important plants and animal species. WQ5 is the preservation of natural features on the site, including the existing topography and significant existing vegetation. ES8 for areas that are identified for significant future growth shall avoid natural heritage areas. The Moyak Small Area Plan, as I mentioned, classifies this as rural and conservation. And that rural designation provides for a low density of one unit per acre. And property is nearby a, a, an industrial activity center. The proposed development density is 0.37 units per acre and is in keeping with uh, the Moyoc Small Area Plan Policy, FLU1, and that promotes compatibility between new and existing development through either larger setbacks, landscaping strips, transition zones, screening, or density step downs. The proposed 37 lot subdivision will have a projected daily water demand uh, of 29,000 gallons per day. Public water is in fact available and the capacity is reserved for this development through August 16th of 2020. 
based on the 2004 student generation rate study that was prepared by Tischler and Associates. The anticipated 37 lot subdivision will generate nine elementary students, three middle school students, five high school students. This particular project is in fact located in the Shawborough Elementary School District, which will then district for Moyot Middle School and Currituck County High School. Based on the January 2020 ADM, Shawborough Elementary School is at an 87% uh, capacity, and um, that extends through uh, capacity through 2021. There is a reduced classroom size that will pick up in 2021 through school year 2022. Based on that, Shawborough Elementary School would, would be at 90% capacity. Moyot Middle School is at 94% capacity based on those numbers. And Curry Tuck High School is 84% capacity. Next slide. The Technical Review Committee has reviewed this project and is making a recommendation that the preliminary plat be approved and the use permit be granted provided the applicant can demonstrate some major arterial streetscape can be guaranteed in accordance with the ordinance. And a few things that we didn't talk about, and I do want to go over now as it relates to that recommendation. Uh, there are, as I mentioned, tidal influenced issues as well as storm events and existing drainage patterns, and we would like an assessment of that uh, existing drainage, storm events, and tidal influence be evaluated at the construction drawing phase to ensure that any adverse impacts that would be a, um, identified would in fact be mitigated. And there are also some existing farm ditches that are being filled and as a result of this development because this was um, prior cultivated farmlands. And, um, in, in redeveloping or developing this property, there will be some farm fields that will be filled in. Uh, there are, there is a ditch system that is located in the, uh, just to the south or west of the access road that drain through this property. So we have a little bit of concern with how that will impact those lots. And um, TRC is asking for a detailed stormwater evaluation to be submitted with the construction drawing process as well that would evaluate the existing drainage patterns and ensure that the existing drainage patterns will not negatively impact the new drainage system, uh, be impacted by the new drainage system designed for this subdivision. And uh, there, there is a streetscape requirement for this subdivision and it requires a 25 foot vegetated buffer of either new or existing trees. And uh, they are proposing that a portion of that be located on those general business lots. And we ask that uh, documentation be provided to the county to ensure that the installation of that buffer as well as uh, the long-term maintenance of that buffer will meet the requirements of the ordinance. And then the last condition that we're asking uh, to be included is no parking signs to be placed along the street at intersections and at the entrance. It's about four to five signs uh, because of the ongoing um, issues that we're seeing with parking on streets and uh, emergency vehicles as well as school buses are having difficulty traveling down those roads when uh, you have on-street parking. This one does have open ditches, so there will be a shoulder that would um, help with that, but on-street parking would not be a permitted use in, in this development, and we ask that that condition be provided. Uh, that was at the request of uh, the fire official. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. What was, um, you said it was 47, is the 47 acres of wetlands, did that include the 4.2 of the camera? So there are 47.51 acres of jurisdictional wetlands, and it does include the 4.42 acres of camp wetlands. Okay. And then collectively with the riparian buffers, um, it's 64.46 acres that will be, de be dedicated as primary conservation area with this development.
Any other questions from board members at this time? If not, I'll go ahead and invite the applicant to come forward, please. If you would just state your name and address for the record. Good evening, board. Uh, Bill Brumsey. I'm with Brumsey and Brumsey PLLC here in Curry Tuck. Uh, first, uh, we'd like to uh, thank you all for your time tonight and appreciate your consideration of this matter. And we also appreciate the thoughtful and thorough report and testimony that Ms. Voliva has given. Uh, the applicant is in agreement with uh, the recommendations of staff, and we feel that uh, when you look at the staff report, listen to staff testimony, and when you hear the expert testimony from uh, the applicant's engineer, that is clear that the use standards are met by competent material and substantial evidence, which of course is a standard here in North Carolina. Excuse, excuse me one second. Um, let me ask, you, did uh, Mr. Brumsey have to be sworn in initially at the beginning of this? No, typically an attorney is just uh, making argument or representing okay. a client yeah. and, and not presenting testimony that you would consider in making your decision. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, let, me, let me back up just a second. And, um, Again, say that we, we agree with the recommendation of Ms. Violet, but we appreciate her report, thoughtfulness and thoroughness of that. And um, we believe that the staff report, staff testimony, and the expert testimony that will be offered will make it clear that the use standards are met by uh, substantial material and, and competent evidence. So with that being said, we would like to call uh, Michael Strader up as a, as a witness. Good evening. Well, let me, Vice I'll, Chairman, let me go through a couple of little things okay. here. All right, just state your name for the board, please. It's Michael Wayne Strader, Jr. All right, and where's your office located? In Powell's Point. Kirby All right. County. All right. Tell us what your educational background is, what degrees you hold, et cetera, and when you when you graduated from uh, from the, the institutions sure. where you obtained them. I hold a bachelor's of science in civil engineering and environmental engineering from Virginia Tech uh, in 2001. Okay. All right. And tell us a little bit about your work background, how long you've been an engineer and, and what you've dealt with and, and where you've done that. Twenty, approximately 20 years of engineering experience. I've um, been practicing engineering for the bulk of that time at my current employment of Quibble Associates, also a couple of other major engineering firms and the United States Geological Survey. Okay. All right, and uh, tell me about your involvement with this particular project. When, how long have you been working on it, and what have you been doing with this with this particular project? Uh, this one is an unusual one due to the the length of time that we have worked on it over the course of definitely over a year. And the board has seen this one before in a different with a different lens in the way of uh, rezoning. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, about been in engineering supervision of this project for greater than twelve months. All right. All right, and with that, I would like to offer Mr. Strader as an expert uh, to give expert testimony on this particular project. Any questions from the board? Okay, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Well, if, if you, I can give a major presentation or a little one, but I'll, I'll be glad to go Whenever into Whenever you feel like you need to present. I'll go into as much or as little detail as the board desires. You can stop me at any point. But I'm specifically um, addressing the, the, the staff recommendation conditions, which uh, representation stated that the applicant has no issue with honoring those conditions. It may be a little bit early for me to discuss some of these items in a preliminary plat use permit because it, a couple of these actually state to please address these during the construction drawing uh, stage, which that's that's the next step that we're going into. Well, I, I guess the, the biggest concern, just really quick, is that first one with the with the tidal influences and the storm events, um, and that area looks, looks so low. So I'm. 
I guess that'd probably be one of the first things you'll have to address because I, I mean that's a major concern through all our developments here is I mean, we, we see that all the time and we keep getting complaints about flooding and not draining and right you heard the the range of existing elevations that cover these parcels um, I, th I think it was stated from one to five feet fortunately um, that kind of falls with that rear wooded line which also jives with where the, the wetland line is we tend to be in excess of the the two to three foot range that's a, about where it is on the the extent of where we would even propose any land disturbance um, if you compare that to some well, the southern adjoining subdivision those elevations based on you know looking at lidar and google earth imagery and everything they're in one or two to foot range um, so where this project's being developed we have the capability of having a little bit better range of our developable areas in the three to five foot range and as Donna stated that applicant is going to propose fill but not in exit not in excess of what's allowed um, we do have on-site septic proposed so we we are going to have to fill to flow to those on-site septic systems Any other the yeah. constrictions on slab? I'm sorry. Are you, you proposing const, uh, on slab? We're not saying that there definitely will be slab on grade or vice versa, but based on what I'm seeing and what the local elevation standards are going to be, I doubt very strongly that any of these would be proposed on slab. Okay. And then you're still going to need to fill? We're going to need to fill so that we can, for multiple reasons, for septic, on site septic to convey for our septic systems, but also the whole subdivision will be treated with on site stormwater management. So that stormwater management, but we have to elevate so that we can control our stormwater management and not adversely impact any, any adjoining areas. And to what level are your BMPs, how much uh, stormwater are they going to be able to retain? Well, to what standard is that being constructed? We are, we're required to, for our, our county stormwater management, to route our post-developed 10-year flow back to two-year two pre-developed woody conditions. So we'll, we'll do that at a minimum, but we're going to, during our evaluations, see how much more that we are going to be able to, to manage on site. A uh, question for Lori. Um, is this this doesn't strike me as what we're normally what is being normally constructed right now like it seems significantly less than what we're preparing 100 year stormwater events is what we, you know the rain capacity that we've been talking about this seems to be a significant step backwards from what we've consistently been approving this is conservation subdivision that they do have to direct access to the wetlands no, I think you're getting ready to basically explain that we don't really have any downstream constraints, adjoiners, or that. I mean, some often we have downstream constraints. Other folks that we may impact here, we don't necessarily have that situation. But on the flip side, I, I understand that the county's also had situations where you've had developments where upstream areas have benefited from being able to drain downstream. Fortunately, we don't have that either. However, Donna picked up on there are two culverts that we're going to be impacting. Only one of those culverts is going to be removed. So we, we have to analyze the, the existing culvert, whether or not it remains as is, or we need to increase the capacity of that culvert. But we're looking at it from a downstream, but also anyone upstream, make sure we're not impacting them when, when this subdivision becomes developed. And then, do we have any idea what this looked like after our nor'easter and hurricane several years ago? Because this just strikes me as really wet. Well, I, I understand. We've definitely been watching it. Fortunately, we've had this project so long, we've been able to watch and monitor. And, and I've seen, witnessed what's happening in the uh, adjoining subdivision. We have yet to see 
any pond of water, even in aerial photography, up within the extents of where we're proposing the subdivision. Um, I, I believe that the applicant could also speak to that, but on, on what has been seen historically. I thought you are the applicant. Uh, I'm an applicant's reference, the engineer. I'm Just checking. Engineer. Okay, so you're saying the applicant would know what that has looked like historically? I've been told that they, no ponding has been seen within the developed. Okay, the I, where it's proposed to be developed. Mr. Vice Chair, Acting Chair, I, if the applicant is here, um, I'd like the applicant to come out, get sworn in, and speak to that as well. Okay. For the record. Um, I need you to get the Bible if you could, sir, if you're going to come up and um, get sworn in, please. You raise your right hand, put your left hand on the Bible. Do you swear to tell the truth, hold truth, and nothing but the truth, so up God? Yeah. Thank you, sir. If you could state your name for the record and your address. Terry Old, 1669 Tulsa Creek Road, North Carolina. Thank you, sir. Um, to address your question, I've been here 66 years, and that formed as long as I can remember, has been in cultivation, and I have never seen any flooding problems. Yes, as it goes to the creek, it gets wet at the creek, and then it, and there's wetlands, and then it comes into a much higher elevation uh, fairly quickly. But it has been formed a long time before I was here without any flooding problems, to my knowledge. Okay, so... I'm not sure that answered the question. So when we had our nor'easter followed by hurricane, uh, for Matthew. Our, uh, hurricane Matthew, Matthew, what did it look like? I was, I did not look at it. I did not, was not there, so, but it was no, uh, okay. I didn't feel the need to look at that as it was not a problem up until, um, that is brought forth as a problem tonight. It hadn't been a problem in the past. Okay. Well, there's not been houses on there in the past, and that's, well, that's the it's, correct. Can I say, the, the, the Fairby, it's the Fairby the tracks, it's the 510 acres. I graded one of those, my company, like probably, what, they've been there four or five years? The back of that property was, was I'm not going to say it was extremely wet. The front was fine, the middle was fine. Towards the back, like they stated, it got softer as you got further back in the projects which it's a butt right to it that, that seems to reflect what we're seeing with the existing topography i mean it it does drop at the, at the wood line the back boundary of this is rolling creek is um and then uh and tolls creek uh, to the east i think is that right into mm -hmm. okay any other questions? I, I will say when I was doing commercial pesticide application, I sprayed the farm a couple of times and was able to go on it. No, no problems. Any other questions for the applicant? Who, who far, uh, me and I were trying to think of who farmed that. Who, who farmed that? The Randy Langle. Okay. Yeah, Randy. But before him, I think Bobby Meggs farmed it for one time, I think. That was a long time ago. Yeah, that's what I sprayed. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Old. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other questions from the board for the representative here? Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. In closing, just to reiterate, we, we agree with the recommendations of staff and agree with the with the TRC recommendations that uh, I believe are still showing on, at least showing on this screen, um, but the applicant does agree with those TRC recommendations as well and uh, feels like the drainage issues that uh, have been raised by staff and by the board uh, can be addressed um, at the construction plan level, and that's what they plan to do. Thank you. Any, any other questions? I'll be happy to get someone up here that can answer them if you have any. Mr. Chairman, I think uh, Mr. Old might have had something else he wanted to say. So, so, he's still or, sworn in, so yeah. come on. I just want to comment. 
that that title study, that stormwater study, is part of the recommendation staff has made and we accept it. So th that would have to be complied with. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. At this time, I will open public hearing and I have a few people signed up. Um, first, I have is it a Dan Humphrey? Oh, okay, gotcha, okay. <laughs> okay. All right, and then, then I had a uh, Dennis and Lori Williams, the same thing? Okay. I'm going to keep going down the list, then. We have a Raymond, a Loretta Sedler. Yes, ma'am. You can state your name and address when you. Loretta Sedler. Okay. And I've lived at 1687 Carrollton Highway for over 35 years. Mr. Chairman, anybody that's going to speak needs to be sworn. I apologize. No, yes, ma'am. I, I mean, anybody who's going to speak, I'm going to get you sworn in. Okay. Um, if you could raise your right hand, put your left hand on the Bible. Do you solemnly swear to tell truth, hold truth, nothing but truth, so be God. I do. Thank you. In the time I've lived there, I've seen farmland taken care of neglected destroyed I've seen the uh, insect problem grow with standing water you can't go outside in the evenings because mosquitoes are so thick they'll carry you away you're talking about holding ponds in these recreation areas what are they trying to do set things up to give our kids typhoid. It's not healthy. That's a swamp back there. And for God's sakes, let the animals have some place to live. We're chasing them out as it is. That's why they're all over the road. And something needs to be considered. Our children need a place to play. They need a place to run. And they need to be able to have their animals, their pets, and just a place to breathe good, clean air, not insecticides and God only knows what else. Cleaning fluids and sprays. This used to be a beautiful place to live, and they call it progress, but you're destroying a beautiful area. Kurtup was one of the most beautiful countries I've ever seen. And now, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed of what we have done to our beautiful county. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. I have three more signed up, um, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to read your names. And if you, if you do want to speak, I'm just going to swear everybody in one, in one time. If you didn't get sworn in earlier, we had a Mike Stradler, John Franks, and a Melissa Brookman. Uh, if anybody, let's come on, let's get y'all sworn in at one time right quick. If you could um, raise your right hand and put your left hand on the Bible. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, so I hope you got Okay, thank you. Okay, that being said, I'm going to start with Mike Stradler. Can you state your name? Oh, is it? Is he here? You spoke? Okay. And uh, have a John... Frakes. Frakes, Okay. If you could just state your name and address for the record, please. Uh, yes, John Frakes. My address is 189B Carrotoke Highway. I'm one of the five adjacent properties. Uh, one of the concerns I had was with raising the elevation of where they plan to build, if there would be adverse effects to the drainage of the five existing properties. During regular raining, we experience ponding and flooding on our properties. Our drainage dishes don't drain out very well. It takes a while for them to drain out. And any of the area where the proposed building is, since I've lived there uh, since September, not a very long time, uh, the growth of the uh, weeds and grass is too tall to tell if there is any ponding going on over there. And that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, I had Melissa Brockman. 
Could you just so, state your name and address, please, for the record? Okay. I'm Melissa Brockman. I'm at 1689F Carachoke Highway. Thank uh, you. So we were the first house of the five development out there, and we'll be the house right up against this new neighborhood. Um, so my concern is the same as raising the elevation. What will that do to us? Um, as John stated, we already experienced flooding and ponding just from a regular rainstorm, not a hurricane or a nor'easter. I've been there for two years. And again, just a regular rainstorm, kids can't go outside, animals can't go outside, it's flooded. So again, we don't know what happens to the other land because it's all grown up so you can't see it. Um, my other concerns would be traffic in and out of that road. We'll be sharing that road with the neighborhood. So what does that do? Dairy construction, we already have trouble with the road being maintained in potholes. So construction vehicles coming in and tearing up the road. Um, and then for no other reason, we just, we moved out of a neighborhood in Virginia Beach to move to the country. And now we're not gonna be in the country. So my other question would be, the shrubbery that was um, proposed to go around the property, does that include anything on the back side of their property that would prevent me from looking out what was supposed to be my country backyard and seeing a row of backyards? So that's my concern. Thank you. Um, I see if the applicant wants to come up and address any of those concerns. Uh, as far as the shrubbery, um, I have I don't know if that is in the plan. If it is, it'll certainly be there. And if that's what we need to do, we can devise a plan for a screening buffer. And the other questions, I believe it was the um, drainage. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the drainage on the well, property. Again, we have addressed that with the staff recommendations yeah. for a study, so we will certainly, and, and obviously, uh, with the elevations, the engineering company can engineer proper drainage. So I don't feel like that is a concern, but uh, certainly we will address that in a engineering manner. How about the roads? Who maintains the roads? I mean, is it who maintains the roads now? I don't know. The, um, if the let her come to Molly. Excuse me, home, ma'am. If you want to come up, come back up to the mic, please. If you're good. <laughs> Thank you. We were the first purchaser out there. And um, it was supposed to be 10, 10 acres, as you know. And the agreement to us, we bought from Don Williams, who we were under the under the understanding they were in business together. I don't know their deal, but we were told they would maintain the road until all 10 houses were built, and then the 10 homeowners would collectively maintain the road. It has not been maintained. Um, if anything's been done, it's because we have pestered Don Williams, and somebody has come out and drug it here and there. So I mean, that's a battle we already fight, and I just feel. That battle is going to be worse now when we have all this construction coming in and out. So it's well, a huge concern. If I mean, far as and this might be a county staff question, as far as with the thirty, if the if this was approved, just thirty-seven lots. I mean, it's going to be a paved road because now it's just a it's just it's a shell road. sand yeah. pretty much road. I, I've I've seen tra I, I didn't know who maintained it, but I have seen tractors out there a few times. We I mean, it was not in any contract. We were told that the developer was supposed to maintain. Until all the houses were done. I mean, that's what we were, that's what we agreed upon. I also have a question. I noticed that in the community meetings, people were speaking about when you purchased your little farmette out there, that you were thinking it was going to be 10 acre. Yeah, lots. that's what, I mean, and that's to how be it honest, was sold yeah, to you. Yeah, not to be like heartfelt, but on, we moved out of a neighborhood in Virginia Beach because we wanted the country life, you know. We have chickens, we have animals, we have kids that come play, and that's what we, we, if we knew that there was gonna be a neighborhood there, we would have never bought that piece of land, because that's not what we want. So we, and as far as I know, the other four that have purchased out there were all told the same thing, 10, 10, I still have, I should have brought it to the meeting. I actually went to the courthouse and talked to somebody. Um, I saw the original plat that they gave me with my contract that showed the 10, 10 acres. I mean, that was a selling point for us, my husband and I. Are you the last, when you come in, are you the last, you're the last one? I'm the first house you see, the blue one. The blue one, so okay. So I'm up against, I'll, we'll be right next to the neighborhood. Okay. So, and I'm not a real estate professional and I don't play one on TV. Um, your issue is going to be with your real estate agent who made assertions that. Well, and the developer, Don Williams. 
main state construction. That's fine, but yes. that's this piece of property that we're talking about tonight. No, I understand not, that. Right, I understand that. Your I'm beef is with them, like, right? Standpoint of. I don't right. know. It might just be a moral issue and have nothing to do with this. But I would have never purchased that piece of land if I knew that this neighborhood was going to be there. So Anyways, that's it. Okay, thank you. I have a question for staff. Um, <laughs> I am. I have significant drainage concerns with this track, and my question is. I. I would think we would be doing our stormwater analysis before going any further rather than wait for construction drawings. And that's out of consideration for the developer as well as the, the residents that are around there. So Do typically we, stormwater analysis are done mm -hmm. with the construction drawings. They don't really go into the great detail <clears throat> and the engineering side of it until they are assured that they have some vested right with that. Now, could this board require something along those lines? You you want to see that earlier? You certainly could. Okay. Uh, what one other thing? Um, getting to the the buffering and the the uh, landscaping requirements. The landscapings require bet between the property and. Caretoke Highway. There's an existing vegetation line along a majority of that. When you come in the, the main entrance road, the one to the north, when you take a left, there, there are some existing trees there that would count. To the right is where the landscaping will be installed. Adjacent to the 10 acre exempt lots of Fairby, there would be no additional landscaping right. there. Can I ask you a question too? Under the land use plan, it says the rural and conservation density is one unit per three acres, correct? Mm -hmm. And, and then, so what they're trying to do now is 0.37 dwellings so per the, acre. The the Moyoc sub area is between one and three. Uh, dwelling units per acre, and then the Moyoc small area plan is one unit per acre, so it's consistent with the small area plan. And consistent with the ordinance. The ordinance allows up to 0.4 units per acre with 60% open space dedication. So you said there wouldn't be a buffer between mm -hmm. um, the 10 acre lots and the subdivision itself? Between this subdivision and the remaining lots in Fairby Acres, they would not, there's no required buffer between those uh, developments and, and adjacent to them. So her property would be looking at the back of six houses? Potentially. Um, can you pull up the. <clears throat> Did you go back to the one with the blue? I think it might be. Yeah, go back to the one with the blue, that one. Yeah. So her lot, correct me if I'm wrong, this is your property here? Yes, ma'am. So, yes, those that okay. development that was. I've got, yeah. The, page, road, the back of the lot. Page 144 of the row. agenda packet. Okay. Mm -hmm. can, you go, can you go back to that for one second? The five. Now, where, where's the the one where there's the five that is the, that goes in the cul-de-sac? Because I might be getting confused here. There, well, there's another one. There's another one that it's all, it's 51 acres where there's, there's that's what are over right in there, correct? That's this one, and then these are the one, two. And then they're Fairby divided. Five. These are the Fairby Acres track that included so these. So coming in the, I got you, so coming in the entrance, she's the first one on the right. Mm-hmm. And so there will be a period of time when road construction is taking place that um, could be times of the day, and this is probably more of an issue for the contractor and the developer to work out with those adjacent property owners so they maintain um, good access as well during construction of the road. Once the road's paid, um, I don't know how long that would typically take uh, between you know, the, the base construction, grading it, the base, and then putting the, the asphalt material on top of that, how long that would take. But um, 
at least during the pavement process, there would probably be uh, some time during the day when limited access to a property, to the, their properties. They'd have to they'd have to work with the contractor so that you at least have one lane open for them to get through. Don, if you could, will you point on the? Or I mean, you know, I mean, so the the the, the farm buffer is going to be on the south side. The farm buffer will be on this side. Yes. Right. Okay. It's not a farm buffer. Excuse me. Or it's, not a. It's it's, it's, it's a. Um, but there's like uh, so there's a ton of trees. For Highway. There are trees along this buffer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and where it's missing along this property line, where it's missing, they'll have to um, place material in there as well. But this this southern section, there there are no trees, and they're proposing to actually place it um, up against the, the rear property line of those GB lots. Ideally, you know, you'd, you'd push everything north and put in a good buffer between those but that would mean if you did that that would mean uh, a potential alignment issue down here and shifting that actual access road over which I mean you you could they could leave theirs there while they're building the new one and then come in and put the material the plant material in if necessary getting back to Mr. Beaumont's concern about the storm water. I think we've seen people who come in here who are telling us before development it was flooded and I thought we were going to, before we approve something where we thought there'd be issues that we'd have storm water studies. Yeah, I mean, it, with this one, I mean, you, we have seen during storm events and tidal events where uh, water has actually come up on this boundary. I wouldn't say we've seen it standing over in here, but it, it def, we've definitely seen it um, along this boundary. And it, it is, the elevation grades are, are between one and five feet, um, they are, and, and, but they are proposing to fill. So when you raise something up, it's just the simple. person down here, it just, which gravity's is the, gonna make is it go down there. <laughs> that, although they do have an outlet, the creek is here. Um, there is a concern with what that means. And as Michael spoke about, there there are some culverts underneath that, what used to be probably a farm path. Um, there are some culverts under there that drain at least the back half of these lots on Caratoke Highway. I don't know how much water um, comes from the north of those five acre, or those 10 acre tracks, those five 10 acre tracks. But if, if some of that includes that, that's a concern we have. As you're filling in those farm ditches that, that typically hold water, um, how is that being accommodated in no, your no, new... Ditches. Where are they? Yeah. They're, they are... You kind of see them here. Out. They kind of follow property lines. And they here. come through. Yeah, yeah, here you go. They're pretty much right here. These are the farm ditches. So are Which are, they follow the, the property line for the so most part. So the five point. lots, or the, the lots that are long and blue, are there, are there farm ditches in between? Um, those? can you go back one? Oh. Yeah. You really can't see it there. But you can, you can see there are farm ditches. I mean, is that the, per, the blue yeah. lines? Those, those are property lines, right. and I'd have to ask Michael to confirm that. Um, do you have a copy of do they actually follow those lines? While he looks that up, just to, to address one point um, that Commissioner Etheridge raised, on the TRC recommendation, that your concern and, and Commissioner Beaumont's concern are the reason I think that staff has got those first two recommended conditions in there. Yes. So, um, you know, the first one basically says that um, they have to mitigate any adverse impacts after they do their analysis and that the um, whatever they change for the new drainage system um, will not negatively impact the folks who are around there. And so with those conditions, if they, they can't get through the construction drawing process until they've met these conditions of the use permit. Correct. There is an aerial map in our packet that shows the plotted 
lot lines on it. You can see the ditches. 144. Yeah. Yeah, you can probably see them better on your screen than when you pull them up on the screen. Uh, the form would just do basically coincide, Commissioner yeah. Evans was saying, coincide with the property lines. Would the, as far as the buffer, like the, um, the, the female, she stated that's adjacent to it, I don't, I don't really understand the landscape. I mean, I know there's a lot of trees out there already, but typically like on a, a buffer on a property between a, I mean, there aren't they required, like would a far, a 10 acre farm at not be considered a, a farm where you would be required to have a If there's farm active buffer? cultivation, a farming operation that's active cultivation. That's when it, yeah, that's okay. when the farmland buffer comes into play. With this buffer requirement, this is more for visibility from Caretoke Highway. It's so your it, it provides for that that buffer so you're not looking at thirty seven houses. It's at least intermittent to a point that it softens that look. Yeah, I think the representative wanted to come back up and explain something or give us some more information. Yeah, I know we're, we're bouncing around a little bit, but as I said before, I'd be glad to go into more detail. So I'd like to go ahead and go into a little bit more detail with respect to drainage right now. I didn't want the board thinking that we haven't been already thinking about drainage. A little bit deeper into that packet that you probably have, we do have the drainage area map or the drainage area exhibit that I think you'd find beneficial. Um, which basically breaks down where not only the, the, the subdivision, how it's draining, but also anything around us. And I'm hearing good information as far as, it, it, I don't know if we can pull up that drainage area exhibit. But it's not the be, presentation. Okay. All right, well, at, as I was trying to say before, there are all of these linear agricultural ditches through the subdivision. None of those existing agricultural ditches convey off-site runoff through this parcel. Anything that falls on the agricultural fields now stays in those ditches, but there, there were only two cross connections. Um, there's an access easement that those five northern lots utilize, and then there's two existing cross culverts that go from a ditch that's on the west side of that gravel or soil pathway that go to the, to the wetland area. Um, one is actually on the property line, the, the northernmost property line. So that one is the one that I was saying earlier that we'll, we'll need to analyze. And there's a good chance that we will actually improve the downstream ditch that outfalls that 24 inch existing culvert. The other culvert conveys overland runoff um, the bulk of that ditch goes all the way to the north to a creek, but those two cross culverts are overflows. Um, so the message I'm trying to get across is we don't have off-site runoff from upstream going through these linear agricultural ditches to try to get downstream. But, I mean, I have a drainage area map that, I mean, I'd like to share with you, but and so we are analyzing it, and the main conveyance that I think Donna Bolivar was trying to point out is that northernmost cross culvert, and we will analyze that and probably improve any drainage conditions for that northern uh, adjoining property owner. There won't be any impact to the the farther there are four other lots to the north because they're. Those are completely, none of it goes through this subject parcel. So, I mean, I, whatever's happening over there is going to continue to happen with no uh, benefit or adverse impact from, from the development of this subdivision. Um, the discussion that I also heard about. Um, there not being a required buffer between the subject subdivision to the adjoining northern prop residential property. If it's the board's desire to, uh, well, uh, let me just say the applicant's not opposed to incorporating 
uh, volunteer buffer along the northernmost section of this of this subdivision to help provide some needed buffer to the the northern adjoiner. How 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 big of an area is that? I mean, I know it's a ten acre property, but I know it's like far as where she looked out her residence. How big of an is it? Two football fields. It's probably a little bit bigger than that. There are, there are going to be. That she'll be looking across. There are a total of five lots along that back edge. So he wouldn't have any problem putting up a buffer. No. The applicant wants to be a good neighbor. We're trying. We're not trying to adversely impact anything around us. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to clarify a statement that Mr. Stockmother made. <coughs> They do this drainage plan. They can't get any type of construction permits without doing the improvements. That plan says it has to be made, correct? So um, the way that it would work whenever they come up with the construction drawings, which are more detailed, it would have to have a plan in place certified by an engineer that states that it meets these conditions. Then they would have to build that infrastructure in the same manner the construction drawings lay out before a final plat could be signed off on. So before you could get a building permit to build the first house here, it would have to meet that condition. And in between those two processes, we still have to apply for and obtain the state permits as well. So there are checks and balances in the system? Yes, sir. Yeah, my only concern is some of those, I, we've had multiple engineered drainage plans that we all watched fail so that that's that's my concern and and it's not a robust enough study and and when and I understand it I understand I get it right you're beside you know a waterway that you can get rid of the water quickly and I don't know that rainfall is going to be the challenge in this neighborhood as much as storm wind event blowing it back up to creeks and I Historically, that area is low. And to address the concern that was voiced earlier, if I understood correctly, you can't tell if it's punting because of how high the, the weeds are on the lot. That uh, just, you know, if it's two feet high and three feet high, that's, you know, kind of hard. Um, Okay, any other questions from the board? Okay. Yes, sir. Just, just in closing and, and to uh, agree with what Mr. Stike Leather says, and I think you all have an understanding of how that's going to work and what's going to have to happen from here as far as the construction plans go and the more detail there. And, you know, Curry, Curry Tuck has to deal with water problems, certainly, and we appreciate the concerns that Mr. Beaumont is uh is raising that you guys are raising and we feel like the uh, the plans are going to address that and um, will uh, have the impact of improving the situation there uh, is is the hope um, and the northern boundary the applicant is willing to add a, an appropriate vegetative buffer on that northern boundary to address the concerns of the, the uh, nearest northern lot there. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Holt will be available to answer any other questions that you have. <laughs> okay, at this time I'm going to go ahead and close public hearing. And um, is there any other questions from the board? If not, I'm going to go ahead and ask the board for a motion. Let me Real quick, okay. I'm sorry. Yes, <clears throat> and I don't know that there's any way to add to it. But, okay, so as part of the TRC, they're going to assess the existing drainage, storm events, etc. But I don't know that there's any standard that has to be that there's in other words I'm not sure what pass fail criteria are part of that analysis 
What I'm saying is we're going to study the problem. And, and I guess the one is it can't negatively, uh, will not be negatively impacted. The existing drainage patterns will not be negatively impacted. And I would guess after the study is done and what's presented to staff, if it's not satisfactory or if it's not going to resolve it, I don't think they can proceed. Is that correct? So then my question would be if it's stamped by an engineer, because I'm tired of learning that lesson, is, is we have no choice. If it's stamped by an engineer, it's good to go, and there's nothing we can say. That's, that's, that's correct. So what would happen if the study would come in, if the study made the statement that no more water was going to be on the property? You know, um, it, in other words, I'll use the fill example. Mm -hmm. We're going to fill this property. So if the engineer says, well, it's going to be filled and graded with this grading plan so that it all flows away from the neighboring properties to Rolling Creek, um, I mean, we, we don't have you know, on staff engineers to go behind every engineering No, but, but if something happens and after they stamp it and it starts back flowing, it, assuming the county so, can go back to... No, the county can't. So, so let me, let me, so um, the neighbors potentially um, are a party that, that could take action. But there's a lot of, of nuance here. All we're guaranteeing is that when it is first constructed, that it won't have a negative impact. I mean, if we're three, four years from now and somebody's come in and, you know, regraded their backyard and put a swimming pool in and it starts flowing back. I mean, there's just, there's so many, I don't want anybody to think that what we're saying here means they will never have a negative impact. What we're saying is that at the construction phase, if it's constructed according to a plan, if the engineer certifies won't cause an impact, it shouldn't cause a negative impact, you know, moving forward unless the environment changes. Yeah, but you could have a negative impact if somebody went in there and if it's not farmed and it's grown up and people are riding UTV. I mean, there's, like he said, a swimming pool or something. There's lots of water. Swimming pool's not going to cause a problem with drainage. It's just... Any other comments or questions from this board? If not, I'm going to open the floor up for again for a motion. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I'm going to move to approve PB 19-24 New Bridges Creek Estates with the TRC conditions of approval because the applicant has demonstrated the proposed use meets the use permit review standards of the UDO. Use permit review standards worksheet. The use will not endanger the public safety or health by constructing a water main extension to serve the proposed lots with domestic water supply. <clears throat> Installing fire protection methods such as fire hydrants and proper access for emergency vehicles to adjacent lots that currently do not have such amenities. Managing stormwater runoff per the Currituck Stormwater <coughs> Manual and or state stormwater requirements to provide management of stormwater runoff flooding and quality. Laying out proposed lot lines to best suit the on-site wastewater evaluations provided by Albemarle Regional Health Services. Each lot will acquire an on-site wastewater improvement permit prior to construction commencement and obtaining review and approval of necessary NCDOT permits, such as a right-of-way encroachment agreements and street and driveway access permits, since NCDOT will have an opportunity to review the subdivision the owner will have the chance to address any safety or health concerns they may have. <clears throat> Excuse me. Two, the use will not injure the value of adjoining or abutting lands and will be in harmony with the area in which it is located. The adjacent and abutting lands consist mostly of single family residents and residential subdivision of same characteristics as the proposed residential subdivision. The proposed lots are similar in size to the adjacent subdivision and residential lots. Proposing a subdivision of such similar nature as adjacent lands and development will not injure the value of adjoining or abutting lands and will be in harmony 
with the area in which it is located. Three, the use will be in conformity with the land use plan and other officially adopted plans. The 2006 land use plan classifies this site as rural and conservation land use classifications in the Mayock subarea. The area intended for residential lots is predominantly in the rural land use classification. The rural and conservation areas contemplate a residential density of one unit per three acres. The policy emphasis for Mayock subarea indicates residential development densities should be limited to one to three acres per units per acre in areas where on-site wastewater is proposed and other county services may be limited. The proposed use is in keeping with the policies of the plan, some of which are policy ES2, non-coastal wetlands, including freshwater swamps, and inland non-tidal wetlands shall be conserved for the important role they play in absorbing floodwaters, filtering pollutants from stormwater runoff, recharging the groundwater table, and providing critical habitat for many plant and animal species. Currituck County supports the efforts of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in protecting such wetlands through the Section 4042 Permit Program of the Clean Water Act, as well as Section 4013 Water Quality Certifications by the State of North Carolina. Policy ES3, coastal wetlands shall be conserved for the valuable functions they perform in protecting water quality and in providing critical habitat for the propagation and survival of important plant and animal species. Camel use standards and policies for coastal wetlands shall be supported. Uses approved for a location in a coastal wetland must be water dependent. Utility easements, bridges, docks, and piers, and will be developed as so as to minimize adverse impacts. Policy WQ5, development that preserves the natural features of the site including existing topography and significant existing vegetation shall be encouraged. If coastal and non-coastal wetlands are considered part of a lot sacred for the purpose of determining minimum lot size or development density, low impact development techniques or appropriate buffers shall be integrated into the development. Open space development shall be encouraged to re reduce impervious surface areas associated with new development and redevelopment. Policy ES8, areas of the county identified for significant future growth shall avoid natural heritage areas. For example, Great Marsh or Knott's Island, Currituck Banks, Swan Island Natural Area, Currituck Banks, Kerala Natural Area, Pine Island Currituck Club Natural Areas, Northwest River Marsh Game Land, and may have marsh areas on the main plan. <clears throat> the Mayock Small Area Plan, an official adopted plan, classifies the site as rural and conservation on the future land use map. The rural designation provides for low density at less than one unit per acre. The property is near an industrial activity center. The proposed development density is 0.37 units per acre. The proposed use is in keeping with the following policy in the Mayotte Small Area Plan. FLU1, promote compatibility between new development and existing development to avoid adverse impacts to the existing community. This is achieved through design and includes larger setbacks, landscaped or forested strips, transition zones, fencing, screening, density, and or bulk step downs or other architectural and site plan measures that encourage harmony. The county will not exceed the county, excuse me, the use will not exceed the county's ability to provide adequate public facilities. The proposed subdivision contains 37 residential lots, the projected water Daily water project demand is 29,600 gallons per day. Public water is available for this development and its capacity is reserved through August the 16th, 2020. Based on the student generation plan rate study prepared by Tischler and Associates, 
The proposed subdivision will generate the following students, nine elementary, three middle, and five high school students. According to the Curry Duck County Schools, the proposed subdivision is located in the following school districts. Shawborough Elementary, 87% capacity. Actual capacity is based on the January 2020 ADM. 90% of the 2021-22 actual capacity is going to be based on the January 2020 ADM. Middle School, 94% of the 2019-21 actual capacity is based on the January 2020 ADM. In the Curry Tech High School, 84% of the 2019 through 2021 actual capacity is based on the January 2020 ADM. And I'd also like to include that the applicant has um, indicated that he will provide a vegetative buffer to on the north property line. I think the county manager... Uh, for staff's clarification, if, if we could kind of tie that buffer to one of the buffer types we already have in the ordinance, it would make enforcement and kind of checking that a much easier process for staff. So, uh, and if we need to know what the types mean, I'll look to plan staff to give a rundown. I guess what's the recommended? Russian Isles. <laughs> yeah. So do you, want, do you want a dense buffer or do you want um, like an intermittent buffer? Opaque, a semi-opaque, opaque's the densest, a semi-opaque buffer, um, or an aesthetic buffer. Aesthetic. And how dense do you want it? It's his motion, so. Semi-opaque. That would be a type C buffer in our ordinance. Describe that, please. Um, it has a 12 aggregate caliper canopy of canopy trees, plus 14 understory trees, and 200 shrubs per 100 linear feet. 200? Or 200 uh, per 100 linear feet. Sorry. 12 canopy, 14 understory, and 20 shrubs per 100 linear feet. Is that similar to like the solar farms? No. The What's the solar farms now are okay, buffer. They're open, okay. What's to be aesthetically pleasing, as you said? That would be um, eight canopy trees. Um, and ten, well, these are aggregate caliper inches. So that would be, um, and that's the inches right here where you put your hand out from, from like shoulder height. Um, ten aggregate caliper inches, understory, and 15 shrubs per minute. Make it that one. Okay. Type B, aesthetic buffer. Uh, the description of this perimeter buffer functions as an intermittent visual obstruction from the ground to a height of at least 20 feet and creates an impression of spatial separation without eliminating visual contact. So you're having um, it's some of that screening, but it's not a complete opaque buffer. So. Maybe there are two options with each one of the buffers as well. There's a 10 foot option, and then there's a 25 foot option. I'm assuming what you're quoting is the 25. Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't scroll all the way up. Correct. I was quoting the 25 foot buffer, uh, the 25 foot option. The uh, the 10 foot option for a type B is two aggregate caliber, caliber inches of canopy trees plus 14 ACI understory trees, plus 20 shrubs per 100 linear feet. And, and Laurie, the 25 versus 10 is the, the depth of the buffer. The depth of the buffer, the width, the depth of the buffer. So, so there are two options with each buffer. If you just... You can leave that up to the, to the, to the applicant as far as which option. Yeah. So, and do we need to read the conditions the TRC recommended or the fact that it was referred to them? Is that good enough? 
So you can reference them if you do it with specificity. TRC rec recommendations as yeah, set sure, forth sure. in the staff analysis. That's, that's, analysis. that's what was most, yeah, what he said. So that was part of the initial correction. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For the type B buffer, is that? Yeah. So adding a type B buffer to them to your motion. To the north part. To the of northern the boundary. Okay, so we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay, do we have any discussions by the board? One other just point of clarification. I assume um, the type B buffer, you mean the area that's not in a wetlands? Because they won't be able to, to plant the buffer in wetlands. But I just want to, for the record. I don't think there's any wetlands there, but yeah. On that part, no, there's not, I don't think. In the back. Okay, no further comments. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. 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 I believe that is a 3 3 <laughs> vote. Is that correct? Can I get uh, can I get a show of hands on all the eyes? Get a show of hands on the knees. Okay. Um, the, uh, the motion scissor. the motion then fails. Yes. Okay. So with the failing of the motion, I'll ask for uh, an alternate motion. Um, I can. I make the motion that we table it until the chairman's back here, and then we have a tie break, so there's seven instead of six. Um, you, you may consider a motion to table. Until we have all parties here until the next meeting. But then. I mean, I, that, that's, that's, I mean, that's my, I mean. I guess we reopen a, you're going to reopen a, Public comment. We could reo. You 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 you've closed the public hearing. I don't believe public you have, hearing is already we can, closed now. You don't have to reopen the public hearing, but um, the, the chairman, uh, an absent commissioner, can still participate so long as they have access to the evidence that was presented and the testimony presented during the course of the hearing. So we just have to make sure that the chairman the has to be. Um, watch the video. He's to watch the video prior to to, to voting out. We'll just ask him that he's been brought up to speed on and watched it. And but the, the proper motion under your rules would be to defer consideration, and then you could set a date that, that the matter would be brought back to the board. So you want to yes. set a motion so defer to it? make it to defer to our first first meeting in August? Well, yeah, I mean, so that would be the next meeting anyway, because maybe the second meeting in August. So, so so your motion would be then to defer action defer action until the second meeting in august to the second meeting in august but, I mean, wait a minute yeah does that the, the 16th of august okay, yeah uh, i mean well, like i said he should have time to watch the we'll defer it to my motion would be to defer it to the first meeting in august second all right i have a motion and a second have any further comments all right all in favor of Mr. McCord's motion? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, the, the motion carries so that the action will be deferred until the first meeting in August. Okay, um, that being said, I am going to take a 10 minute recess, if we could, real quick, and we'll be back in 10 minutes. <laughs> this meeting back in order, and we're next item is going to be under new business consideration and action on a resolution to approve the regional hazard mitigation plan for Currituck County and I believe we have Mary Beth that's going to present or Laurie's going to kick it off and then Laurie's going to start it they're going to they're going to okay yeah. okay hold on I don't know, I'll click through all this now is this the five minute version or the it can be the five minute version. Five minute version. We can maybe get it down to three minutes. The There's 26, 29 slides. How far you want to go? Are you 
Did I go too far forward? Yeah. I tried to get like five, six okay. slides in. Well, go ahead. Um, <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman, we, or Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, before you tonight is the hazard mitigation plan. This is a plan that staff uh, and the public have undertaken since um, late spring, early summer of 2019. Uh, this is a, a new plan, um, and it's done in conjunction with Derrick County. We completed one in 2015, but we did it um, as a, the Albemarle region, um, including Camden, Jawan, Dare, Gates, Hertford, Pasquotank, and Verquimans County. Um, in that plan, we did not meet all of our CRS community rating systems. We didn't get the most points that we could out of that plan because uh, it was too broad stroke. Um, so uh, when it was time to update that plan, Curry Tuck County uh, teamed up with DARE because we had some of the very specific uh, CRS community rating system issues as far as the flood maps, uh, as far as our hazards. Um, so that regional, uh, so we went from several counties to just us, DARE County and the municipalities in DARE County. So, um, to structure the plan, um, we went through, um, we introduced it, the hazard mitigation the purpose is to identify, assess, mit and mitigate hazard risk to better protect the people and property within Curry Tuck and Dare County from the effects of natural and human caused hazards. Um, so, so for the first, the first chapter of the introduction provides context and justification for the plan. Why do we do this? Why are we required to do it? Um, there was an act, um, the Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000, the federal government decided that counties, communities needed to plan against the hazards because of the amount of money they were spending trying to recover from hazards. So um, we do that to meet that requirement. We also do the hazard mitigation for my end specifically for a uh, community rating system. And, and that is the system that we use to reduce our flood insurance premiums. We get a good score. If we do a lot of things to help mitigate impacts of flooding, we can get a lower um, flood insurance premium for our residents. And that, you all know, is very significant here in Curtis County. So um, the, we went through the planning process. Oh, I'm sorry. We did get a... a grant from uh, the State Department of Emergency Management um, to get a consultant to come in to update our hazard mitigation specifically to target those CRS points along with addressing other community needs. Um, so I... I've thrown you all out of sorts. At you moment. have, but that's okay. Sorry. Just give me a second to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> the yellow lights flashing oh, under. <laughs> so, um, we reviewed the current plan. We found the weaknesses. We found what was working in the current mm -hmm. plan. Um, some of our action items. We involved the public. We had a steering committee that involved. Um, we had some uh, four citizens that were uh, Laura Eddy from the Nature Conservancy, Anthony Dickinson from Farm Bureau, Warren Edis from Quibble, and Jason Summerton, who's a realtor on the beach. We involved those people to get ideas from them about the risk uh, assessment. Uh, we had, let me just forward on. Um, so here's a summary of the um, Hazard Mitigation Planning Committee meetings. We went through that. Um, we had a website, we had a public survey, and we had 853 responses, and, and I thought this was interesting. We had 63% of the respondents felt we are somewhat prepared for a hazard. Um, and then here's another question, which is a little bit disappointing. Do you know where evacuation centers are? Nearly 58%, 57% of the Respondents did not know where storm shelters were. So we involved the public in this. Um, we looked at we looked at local inventory, a critical facilities map. We looked at our um, natural assets. We looked at our cultural assets. And um, right here where we, we go over historic properties, some of the historic properties and um, 
things that we need to make sure are preserved during the hazard. Um, like I said, we looked at our capabilities, we looked at things that have changed, um, we reviewed the existing plans and actions, we documented success stories where we found out where mitigation efforts had been effective, and we documented areas where mitigation areas have not been effective. Um, we documented new hazard, we not documented uh, changes in capabilities for each, uh, because this is not just involves planning, but it involves hazard mitigation, um, I mean emergency management, it involves engineering, it involves a lot of the different county um, departments as far as our assessment of this plan. And also we incorporated new data and studies on risk and then also incorporated growth and development changes. So. The main hazards that we profiled were coastal hazards, of course, erosion, rip current, and sea level rise, drought, earthquake, extreme heat, flood, hurricane and tropical storm, severe lightning, severe winter storm, tornado, and wildfire. We also looked at technical and human caused incidents like hazard uh, materials incidents, radiological incidents, and terrorism and uh, transportation infrastructure failures. So those are all taken in uh, all hazards that we, we assessed. Um, and here's a priority risk index, um, and you can see how the different hazards stack up in our area. Um, we had one. We had one. We had one. North Carolina had one a few years ago. Um, but obviously, uh, coastal hazards like rip current and our uh, hurricanes and tropical storms. Um, those are the big hazards, thunderstorms and winds and, and the flooding, and those are all our big hazards here. So, high risk, no surprise in there about what it is that, um, that our analysis said, and, and, and public input. These are the things that we're concerned about as far as having. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, we compiled this plan, and now we have four main goals of the hazard mitigation plan. Um, goal number one, reduce the risk of loss of life and personal injury from hazards. So you see, and then uh, we have these four main goals, and we have objectives within those goals. Um, objective one, one, educate citizens to encourage individuals' responsibility to protect themselves. So I'm just going to go through the goals. But goal number two, maintain critical facilities and infrastructure to protect them from damage. Goal number three, to ensure that hazard mitigation practices, construction techniques, policies, and ordinances are integrated for both new development and post-disaster development to enhance resiliency and enable speed of speedy recovery. Goal number four, improve interjurisdictional cooperation, coordination, especially regarding the reduction of hazard impact. So we took these four goals, these big overarching um, goals, things we want to attain. We got objectives, and from those objectives, we became take into mitigation action plans. Um, and we do have, Prairie Tuck has, I'll put her write it down, 29 action items. And like I said, these were, some of these were brought forward from the old hazard mitigation plan. Some of these are new. Some of these are just ongoing. Um, so, and then after this is adopted, it has been approved by FEMA. Right, it has been approved. It has been approved by FEMA. And once we enact it, um, then we will have to report annually on the status of the plan. We have to pursue the implementation of all 29 of those action items that we I just spoke of. Um, and we will monitor funding activities and hopefully continue with our public involvement um, to, to make sure that we are, we have a, addressed the hazards that the public's aware of. Um, and we'll integrate this plan with all of our other planning efforts, which is why this is very much a, a planning community development and emergency management um, cooper cooperative plan. Um, so that was a five minute, seven minute, seven minute. On, on a serious note, just so you guys know, the staff, I mean, we moved quick through it because everybody's um, getting late, but the staff puts a ton of time into putting this together. Um, and it's, it's a big effort. So, as you can see from the old version. Yes. I mean, even what you had in the packet was pretty <laughs> intense. Are you going to read that all? Like, no. We need to make note of how big you are. <coughs> mm. 
have any questions about the plan, about the public process, Mary Beth and I can hopefully answer that. No, you do have some excerpts because I, it is I, That's where I saw the excerpts. Okay. Six, five hundred. I think 500. there was a link. There was a link. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be on the cover sheet. Okay. There's a, a link okay. to it in the, uh, the explanation. I had trouble sleeping. Oh, I think, yeah. Off that. But that no. one, though. <laughs> you know the old one once the new one's enacted. No, so yeah, so so um, yeah, so so what staff needs is um, action to adopt the resolution, which I believe is um, in your packet to approve the plan if if you guys so desire. Yeah, no, I didn't know if Mary Beth had to come up and talk or not, or just it, you're good. Okay, 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 great. Um, well, that being said, then yes, the board does need to take action on this tonight. So I'd ask for a motion from the board. I'll I make move to approve. Oh, somebody, go ahead. We all jumped go ahead. at once. Somebody. Mr. Chairman, I move to uh, support this plan as developed by uh, county staff uh, in the form of a resolution. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? What? Uh, specifically to adopt the resolution that's in the packet. <clears throat> to adopt the resolution that's in the packet. Second. Okay, have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? There's no second. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. All right. The next item on the agenda is a consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. A motion second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. And the next item is closed session. So I'd like to make a motion that we go into closed session. Motion, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you.